So today we have the pleasure of spending our time with Nani Chacon and Jeffrey Gibson in conversation about their work. Um, for those of you that are new to Nani and Jeffrey, which I don't think anyone in this room is, but just for fun, short introductions. Nani is a Diné Chicana artist based in Albuquerque. She currently has a solo exhibition titled uh, Spectrum that's up in our Sight Lab gallery space. It's a new body of work exploring cultural repair and preservation through visual storytelling. And her exhibition runs through August 21st. So if you haven't already seen it, please check out the show. And Jeffrey, thank you for being here. Yeah. Jeffrey Gibson is Choctaw and half Cherokee. He's based in Hudson, New York, and his solo exhibition, The Body Electric, opened this weekend on Friday, and it runs through September 11th. <clears throat> the Body Electric highlights Jeffrey's use of material, provocative language, and collaborative community-rooted performances and video. There's going to be some really exciting programming accompanying his exhibition throughout the summer, so please keep your eyes peeled for announcements on that. So, over the last few weeks, I've had many people ask me um, if I plan to have both Jeffrey and Nani's show overlap. And the truth is, is that I didn't. Um, a lot of work goes into putting together an exhibition and there are a lot of moving parts. And as unromantic as it might sound, sometimes it has to do with timing. And while their exhibitions overlap on the calendar, uh, to our joy and all of our luck, their exhibitions also overlap in so many other remarkable ways. And so, um, I would like to uh, acknowledge that you're both friends. I didn't know that when I invited you to be in exhibitions. And so can you talk a little bit about how you met and how long you've known each other? Uh, yeah. Go for it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> for me, um, I think I always have, when it's with artists, I always have two meetings. And one, of course, is when I meet their artwork and when I see their artwork for the first time and the impression that it has on me. And um, so I'll, I'll talk about that because for me that's always like the beginning of the, the intrigue of wanting to get to know somebody and, and um, also feeling a, a connectivity, a connectivity to, to our mindsets, the way we kind of think and, and put things together. But the first piece that I saw of Jeffrey's was actually at Mogna. And I was doing a residency there, and he was a part of a textile show that was in the exhibition, and it was uh, one of his large, one of your large, <laughs> yeah. um, punching bag pieces. And when I saw the piece, I, I thought a woman had made it, um, because it really had embodied this fierce strength but also like the strength of a woman, like the, the delicateness and all of the cones and the beating and then just the metaphor of thinking of like fighting through and the tenacity um, that we endure and it just encapsulated it really well. And then I looked at the tag and was like, oh, Jeffrey, all right, <laughs> who is this? <laughs> and, and that was, that was, uh, that was it, that, that, that was a spark um, for me. To, to really follow your work and to, to see it. And, and, and then later on, um, as I started to, and we'll talk about this later, but um, followed your work, <coughs> I have always been really interested in, in your titles. And just because I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> 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 I like that song or something. <laughs> um, but I want to say a year ago, yeah. a year ago, Jeffrey was, or no, this was actually. It was in February. Yeah, in, Feb yeah. in February. Of this year. No, October. It was October. October, yeah. October yeah. Last year, sorry. <laughs> so October of this past year, um, Jeffrey was creating a print at the Tamarin and um, just took the time, time to, to connect. And um, Jeffrey has children. And I always seek out artists 
that also share in that experience of being a parent and juggling art life, parent life, parent life, art <laughs> life. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, so, so for me that, that, was, that was really important. And um, also just kind of recognizing that I've always been really thankful when other people have extended those kind of um, invitations for me knowing that I've had, that I, that I travel with my, my son sometimes and um, bringing back the Mother Day theme. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, br that I travel with my son and just ex extending hospitality beyond the art world, beyond like, you know, just seeing each other in galleries and seeing each other in whatever else in interviews and stuff like that. And uh, we went trick-or-treating. <laughs> yeah. That's, all... <laughs> That's awesome. Did you dress yeah. up? Totally, yeah. You dressed up. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Halloween. Yeah. Um, yeah, similar. I think we were Instagram friends for a really long time. And so I would follow what Nani was doing um, with murals because murals for me, uh, you know, public art murals, it's kind of a, it's, a, it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to do well. And I think Nani does it really well. And I know her engagement with the community when she does a mural is uh, very deep. And um, I really respect that, just also within the art world, that's not always the case. And uh, even in my own work, I, I love the time I get to spend with people who we collaborate with, but it's not nearly, I'm sort of like shallow. Not shallow <laughs> as a person, but my, my time I get to spend with people tends to be less than you do. Um, also, I think, um, yeah, so when we met this uh, last year in October, um, you were so incredibly generous. We showed up at your house and you had made this huge amount of food and it was <laughs> wonderful. And then we went trick-or-treating and we must have hung out pretty regularly and um, got to know Autumn and uh, hang out with Raven and Candace also. So yeah, it's, I think, especially within the Native community, we're all spread out so far um, across the land that I think it is true. It's rare that we get to just hang out together and have a meal and not talk about art. And um, so that's really, I think been a great place. It's really special for us to have two artists um, in conversation that have this like respect and love and care for each other. It's really wonderful to have you both here. Um, again, like I said, there's so many complementary overlaps in your <coughs> exhibitions, um, and one you know one overlap is the title of this talk, reclaiming history. And I'm I see each of you working both directly and indirectly with indigenous histories within your practices. And I wonder um, if you could talk a little bit about what reclaiming history means to you and how you might use it in your practice to retell stories or reintroduce narratives. Uh, yeah, so sometimes I feel a little, a little divided between practices. I have definitely like the public art practice <clears throat> and for me, that, and I'll, I'll kind of answer from that, that place first um, in this question. And reclaiming a history for me is um, really taking history out of like institutions and placing it back in the hands of the people, back in landscape, back in a place where we can interact with it and be a part of it. Um, I think that there's been so much kind of disconnect um, with the documentation of histories and who gets to tell those histories. And, and when we work, you know, and, and especially that within education and, and the idea of an educated history. Um, so a lot of my work as a muralist is, is really just about that, is really about creating engagement really creating conversation, starting from a place of conversation, starting from a place of uh, like, let's just sit down and see what comes up and see how we can create a response with this and then put it gigantic on a wall and further that response, further that reciprocity of like people engaging in it, people seeing it, talking about it, giving back to it. And if in one day it disappears, it disappears if one day, but while it's here, how are we, how is this affecting our space? How is this affecting 
the future and the future history and stories that we interact with and we create. History is here. This is history. Um, and in my personal work, and especially with this body of work, um, it was really about creating an impetus in preservation and realizing my role as a, as like a soon-to-be elder, even though I'm not, <laughs> even though I'm not there yet, and I, I'm thinking in that way because I, I'm appreciative of the knowledge that my elders have have given to me and and my mom and my dad and the story and it, it's always started with stories and I think that there's a genius behind storytelling. There is such a genius there that um, it, it can't ever be documented. It can't ever be written down because the genius in it is the sharing and the connection and the way that stories are are told within time and it's a time marker and it's a place marker and it's a people marker and it's a relationship marker and it's all of these things and um, this body of work was really about about beginning that conversation again beginning that conversation um, in a in a place that that means a lot to me with with our creation stories and starting that spark so this body of work is is um, for people that know the stories, but also the intrigue to ask questions, to begin that, to have that impetus um, and reclaim that. And um, it's created for children. It's created for um, adults and elders. And I, I want people to, I, those are the people I want to, to reclaim these. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think, if, I think if you're, if you identify as a native artist, and if that's the context that you want to be a part of, you really quickly start to realize how many stories people are unaware of, how many kind of um, protocols and traditions that people are unaware of. And it just multiplies exponentially when you start thinking about how many tribal communities there are, how many um, different communities within those communities there are. And, and then there's the question about like, well, what, what can be shared, what should be shared, like there's a lot of trust issues um, involved in telling other people's stories. And um, so I think for me, I, I, I found myself, maybe in the last 10 years, really focusing really on the turn of the century, late 1900s, and looking at the 20th century. Because when you look at native arts in the 20th century, I kind of grew up thinking like, well, where, where were we all? Like where, where were the painters, where were the performance artists, where were the filmmakers? So I got really excited when I discover an artist who, not just one painting, but somebody who really pursued art making for the majority of their life, whether that was commercially successful or not. And <clears throat> I think also the division between um, cultural practice and people who were engaging in American popular culture is also a real interest of mine because, because of the relocation acts, um, because of the you know, people leaving the reservation um, either by choice or by force. And that kind of acculturation that happens and what people choose to hold on to and how they hold on to it in an urban environment or outside of a native community, that's probably most reflective of my personal experience. So I, um, you know, I guess I grew up at a time when people, there's a lot of commenters like, I can't believe a Native American had a rave. <laughs> it's like, it's like, yeah. No, seriously. Or like when I studied in London, they were like, I can't believe you're a Choctaw person at the Royal College of Art. And I was like, yeah, imagine that. And that kind of like countering of, you know, what's embedded in that comment is, is still the idea of Native people as being, you know, primitive or being uncivilized. And here we are in the height of the civilized. And I just, you know, when I look at who, what my life was like as a child moving around so much, you know, yeah, I did a lot of things that I had to assume there are other Native people who had similar experiences, if not the same, similar. You know, we're traveling the world, we're exposed to the world, politics, the environment, pop culture, rap music, hip hop, all of it. And so I think I just started wanting to, in an earnest way, exhibit those threads that come together in my own life. And that's kind of what drove the hybridity of materials and of subject matter. 
And I think um, the longer I've done that, the more I can find you know, a handbag from the 30s, um, like you might find in Pauli, the piece here. And that handbag clearly is a commercially made handbag, right? So many other people carried that exact same handbag. But here's somebody who beaded the entire bag um, to represent who they are, um, probably at a time of, of uh, urban relocation. So it's a sense of pride, um, obviously the labor um, that goes in. And I think taking something that's mass produced and making it specifically unique to a person is something that I really cherish and value and is in alignment with the way that I think about artwork. Um, but also all the, all the subcultures that do the same thing. So like punk, you know, a lot of hip hop, a lot of like drag, um, people who kind of transform the world to support themselves. And those are the stories that I'm, I continue to be interested in finding ways to tell. And to tell them in ways that are, they're kind of like, I think of it as like exhibiting the residue of these histories because I, I'm not really getting the specificity. I don't know whose handbag it was. I don't know what their narrative was. But I want to think that that represents many other stories. Yeah, so if, if I can just segue, because it kind of le it's leading into the, the question that I have for you next, is um, there are works included in the exhibition that were shaped either directly or indirectly by your experience at the Field Museum in Chicago. <clears throat> and I was wondering if you could um, tell us a little bit about that experience, um, particularly if there were stories or items from the experience at the Field Museum that still resonate with you and how it impacted your work. Yeah, I mean, uh, my experience at the Field Museum started in 1992, I believe, and I joined the museum as a uh, research, research fellow for NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Repatriation Act. And um, you know, my job was to assemble all of the documentation of tribally affiliated material for visits, and then to work with the collections managers to bring those out into rooms so that um, a lot of times elders, the tribal delegations, would come and view the objects. And those experiences were always different. They involved a lot of ceremony, a lot of prayer, um, they, a lot of uh, anger, a lot of uh, trauma and pain and really radically different belief systems about what we were looking at. And so I think the impact of that was really that every object has multiplicity of meanings, depending on where it's at, who owned it, who used it, multiple people, um, and that those are the stories also. And really the way I think that objects tell stories is you ask them, which is, kind of a, uh, that was the biggest shift for me. It was seeking permission from objects and, and asking objects to tell you their story. And then it shifts everything about time because they don't speak like humans <laughs> and they're not supposed to. <laughs> and so you have to wait and you listen and you pay attention and every now and again something, something emerges that feels like, okay, I've learned something from this object. I think, uh, um, and that's continued to unfold in, in my life, for sure. But there's also a great deal of trust. I mean, working with objects, you have to, you have to find this line of where um, you trust yourself, where you trust the object, where you trust the relationship. And, um, and also pay attention to when there's, some, there's something that's telling you, like, you're not meant to be here, you're not meant to hold this, you're not meant to look at this, nobody should be touching this. Mm -hmm. And those are, those are, as an artist, those are really it has expanded my kind of emotional spectrum like in an incredible way. Wow. So I think even I, was, I tell people about this exhibition, we didn't really like work too hard on what we wanted to include. It came together it came pretty easily. It came so naturally. It was really yeah. like two conversations and a yeah. little bit of crying and, and we got yeah. it together. <laughs> it was, it happened. But it's a, great, it's a great combination of work that I think hasn't yeah. been shown before. And, and that's one of the things I think about like Again, this kind of like trust issue. Right. And Nani, you know, um, just kind of spinning off what, what you would um, said, you know, you've done so much research around the Diné creation story for your body of work. And I wonder um, if you can just tell us like where, where you started and, 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 and how, you, how you sought that um, information and how you made the choices of, I mean, the beautiful thing about your exhibition is that it's not a linear narrative. 
uh, you can you can drop in and out in many different parts, and it's it's almost like you just opened up something very beautiful and left it there for people to experience. And I um, I just wonder, you know, were you were you reading these stories? Were these stories um, told to you and and when you were growing up, or you know, did you have to kind of like seek out this like kind of reclaiming these stories for yourself as an adult? Yeah, for me, it it, it was all of it. Um, one starting. I think as artists, we always start with our own intrigue. You know, we always start from a place in us that just like doesn't leave, you know, like whatever nagging question or, or nagging inspiration we might have. Um, for me, I think it started as a place of, of knowing, knowing stories um, and having them told to me. Uh, a lot of our stories are directly related to our ceremonies, so, so you know, knowing, knowing them in that context as well. Um, and then also the intrigue of knowing, wanting to know what, what was printed about them. So I read a lot and, and sought that out from, and seeing and wanting to understand like the academia, white scholar, perspective, somebody who's removed from the culture entirely, and how they interact with, see, interpret, um, and document something, um, and how, how that feels. And so really it was, it was anything. If I knew anyone who knew, who knew any parts, um, you know, I'd ask them, or if it would come up in conversation, I'd be like, how, tell me that story, you know, tell me tell me this or tell me that. I think, I think for me it's always important to hear people tell a story. Um, like I said before, there's a magic in that. Um, but definitely went through, I looked on YouTube. There's yeah. stuff on YouTube, I, everything, you know? I mean, I, I think that when you research something, you should dig deep, you know, do, do all the things. There's, there's comics, you know, there's comics written and there's bits and pieces and even more contemporary um, iterations that I think are, are woven, you know, that people have, have taken little bits and pieces of, of parts of our stories. And the internet definitely has like its own train and cult of some of some characters um, and deities. And so for me, it was really like all of it, like yeah. all of it, whatever, whatever came about because I want to know what's out there. Um, and then kind of take a big like sifting tray, right? And, and discern that for myself and feel what feels, um, what feels right, I guess. I, I really understand mm -hmm. what you're saying about um, the objects and I've had experience like that working with objects intertribally and there's, I, I want to say that there's an intuitiveness, right? That there's an intuitiveness that you have to be cognizant of and respectful that, that you're, you're sharing in something. Um, and then, you know, go through that process of, of how, how am I now the storyteller in this? How mm -hmm. am I the one that is taking part in retelling this and, re, you know, bringing these things out in a respectful way, bringing it out in a, pro in a way that is also um, intriguing to me and important to me, um, because that's what the storyteller does. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all of those things. Yeah, I, you know, we, Nani and I worked <clears throat> together, you know, maybe a year and a half putting together, you know, these ideas, but, you know, clearly you've been working on this body of work for a really long time. <laughs> Yeah, yes. I started it about five years ago. Yeah. So. And I, I see it as being ongoing because it is so personal. Um, and they're, they're, uh, it, start, it started as drawings, as illustrations. Um, and I have other illustrations, too, within this body of work that will also aren't 10-foot paintings. Um, and yeah, and I, I, I mean, it's part of my process is kind of, you know, starting with a drawing and doing iterations and, and um, kind of feeling that out and daydreaming about it and, you know, kind of 
scratching them out, sometimes throwing them away, starting over. So I, I see this body of work as not only, I mean, before the five years, it's, you know, was the, the 35 years. <laughs> and then, <laughs> you know, I'm sure that this will continue on after that. Yeah, there's not very many, um, at least in my knowledge, but not, not a lot of visual representation, visual storytelling around these stories. So I think it's so beautiful and powerful to have um, your perspective and, and your storytelling style. Um, Jeffrey, you already kind of sort of talked on this, but, but I kind of want to circle back to it. Um, a lot of your work calls attention and celebrates the other and uh, your influences of like drag culture, pop, pump music, uh, literature um, has really strong influences, particularly on the language and words that you use in your work. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of those inspirations. And, and, and I'm very curious about um, your own personal authorship, like The Land is Speaking, Are You Listening is a, a piece that, that Jeffrey did for the exhibition. And it's a huge mural that's in our lobby space and it's authored by you and, mm -hmm. and, and just, I don't know, how do you balance that and are you moving into a, to like this new era where you're like <clears throat> authoring um, your, your own words or can you talk I mean, about that? Yeah, I can. Yeah. I have a big theory about it, which uh, <laughs> could be true or not true, it's just the way that I think about it. I think, um, you know, from the exclusion of Native people and the erasure of Native people historically in uh, American culture, I really, um, started thinking about how I had a really hard time authoring my own statements because I felt like we haven't had many opportunities to be the author of our own story. And I think other cultures share this too. I don't think it's just Native people. But um, so it's been a challenge to try to find like a muscle that has confidence to speak, which I think also comes across in a lot of some of the performances in particular. I'm working with people on speaking and voice. Um, so I think finding meaning in language that was around me made sense because it kind of resonated. Like pop music, for instance, it collects us, you know, in a way, but we all still have our own individuated experience of it and we also can kind of get caught up in this cultural phenomena of pop. And, um, and I also grew up, you know, paying attention to like Basquiat and Warhol and what was happening in New York in the 80s. That was sort of my art feed when I was in high school. So I think, um, yeah, I don't think I thought I would have used language, but I found that when I started showing work, I really had a very specific meaning that I wanted to come across and rarely were people getting it. So I decided to literally just put it on the work. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and, and it was amazing, that was kind of a step towards authoring, you know, I was kind of like, oh, this is how I say those words, but yet they're still understandable for other people to engage with. And so now I, um, I collect words, I write down thoughts uh, on my phone regularly, I text myself regularly um, with statements and words. And I've realized now that they, I, I'm interested in things that are more sort of like, like eavesdropping in public, you know, <laughs> like what people say. And so they don't have to have, they don't have to have the same kind of like pop resonance as some of the earlier work. And I think sometimes, even when I am looking at lyrics, I'm not so much looking for the lyrics that we're all familiar with, but I look for the ones that kind of lead up or come after, you know. Sometimes there are lines from, um, from movies, uh, from speeches, uh, from sermons. Um, sermons are great, um, hymns, and so, um, yeah, and, and I, I, I just get kind of pulled in a direction. So like the other day I was thinking of looking at um, uh, political speeches and, and trying to find, because they're, they're so crafted, right? They're not, right? they're not at all off the cuff. They're not at all right. kind of of the person who's speaking. And, and obviously because we're in a very heightened political state, um, so yeah. Wow. I, th I think of them when I experienced your work, it's, it's like you're casting spells. <laughs> Words are so powerful and sometimes they're just like... They, I think, know. yeah, I mean, I think the idea of manifesting, whether you think yeah. of it as a, is, is true. I do think that uh, indigenous artists are in a, 
a place right now where we are actively manifesting things yeah. and planting these seeds as fast as we can and and sort of sharing them as fast as we can, right. you know. Um, and I'll just share because I think it is kind of funny. Okay. One of, I think it's, no, it's not actually here, but when this body of work was coming together, I collect pins, and so Brandy gave me a pin today. Yeah. Wait, what Doomed. does it say? Doomed to nonconformity. Yes, <laughs> so that's what we all have on. We're conformed. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're, all, we're all wearing them. Yeah. They were authored by Devin Ludlow. Yeah. Um, but I have this pin that I found, and it says, uh, uh, better because we can be. And I thought, I was like, oh, it's amazing. This is probably some, like, uplifting, like, multicultural moment in the 70s or 80s. And it's written in that kind of, like, kind of hippie script. And, um, and so I was feeling really good about it. I used it, and it's still in the work. But it turns out it was a Canadian U-Haul campaign. <laughs> That was riffing off of that kind of, kind of, you know, propaganda. Um, but I still thought, you know, that's the thing, again, about being able to, like, repurpose things. I know if I put that into my work, for instance, like, no one's thinking about U-Haul, hopefully. hopefully. I am now. Yeah, now you are, yeah. <laughs> and uh, one of the things, you know, you said it seems like they're casting spells. One of the things, the titles of your work were always very appealing to me. Because I, you know, sometimes I'd recognize these pop references or speech or something, and to me, they became like an active protest statement. Like in my mind, yeah. I think <clears throat> having having this background of of creating like political propaganda, um, it became like this immediate connection of of creating of like like making a slogan that is so relatable because it's something we've all experienced, whether we were singing it in our car or like laughed at it together in a movie or, you know, heard it in church. Um, but making that like the recognizable and identifiable protest of our time and a relationship that we share. So, but that, when I look at your work, that's what I see is like, like, to me, they look like active, active signs of protest. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think they are. I mean, I think, um, I was just thinking about, so, so, so um, The Land is Speaking, Are You Listening? It was one of the ones where I felt like I didn't need to have that kind of like three or four word like zinger, <laughs> but I could extend it. And, um, and that's just because my, my mind has completely shifted towards um, the environment and the planet and thinking about that, that narrative. Um, and then uh, She Never Dances Alone was also authored by me and came together pretty quickly. Um, and it really just had to do with the, the, the matriarchal histories and how they are present, they're still here, and the invocation of ancestors and spirits um, when, when the women dance. And so that's where She Never Dances Alone came from. So they're always pretty direct. Like they're never, like they have to, they're not, they're not, um, you know, I try to make them as direct as possible. But yeah, also. tell us a little bit about um, She Speaks Up to Take Them Down. That was authored by you and that, that's a part of a, a piece in the exhibition if y'all haven't seen it, but it's um, To Name Another and it was yeah. a performance piece that we did here a few weeks back, but um, that, that was its stepping off point, the whole, the whole piece, correct? Yeah. I mean, I had done some performances. This was in 20, probably 18, when I was approached by the National Portrait Gallery in DC. And they, com they wanted to commission a performance. And I was kind of surprised, like, why not a painting or a sculpture or something? And, um, but I was excited. I mean, performance is challenging for me, and I feel like it stretches me as an artist. And um, so I was kind of just trying to figure out where to start. And the Kavanaugh hearings were happening at the time for the Supreme Court seat and um and it was the day in fact i was in dc getting ready to do a performance and it was the day that um dr blasey ford's testimony was being given and it just came to me the word she speaks up to take them down and i started thinking about naming and naming ceremonies and uh purposeful and intention in naming so i started thinking about other people who i respect <clears throat> other actions that they've taken and how that would inform a name so then I just sat down and I made a list of one through 50 and I would just kind of go back to that list and try to fill them in if I met somebody. 
And one of the ones is Jean Quick to See Smith. So there's a garment that says Quick to See, or she's Quick to See, and on the drum as well. And I guess that's the same thing I'm saying about manifestation. You know, when someone says that word and it gets picked up by the wind and it carries, or the drum and the sound kind of hits as you're speaking the name and it kind of continues beyond your space. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Nani, you, you touched on this a little bit, but I, I, I think um, maybe you can unpack it a little bit more. You, you have, for me, like from my perspective, like two very distinct practices. You have a very public practice and a very private, well, private, you know, personal practice in your studio. Um, you do so much work with the community and socially engaged <clears throat> projects, and there's a lot of collaboration. And, you know, I, I, I think of you as one of the most active listeners that I've ever met. You, you're in dialogue with communities and, and creating these beautiful murals and public spaces. So can you talk a little bit about um, your journey from graffiti art to becoming a muralist, and then maybe a little bit about um, your balance, your balancing act between your private and public practices? How much time do we have? Oh yeah, how much time do I'm we have? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. <We'll> go fast. <laughs> <laughs> really fast. So I was born. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. So I started out in the public. I my work has always been informed by being in public space. Um, I, I didn't draw or create work before I did graffiti, and graffiti made me make work in front of people, and in an abstract way. Um, and I, I became very keen and very aware of public interaction with art. Um, that's the way that I was informed and that's the way that I first learned to ever create art. Um, there, wasn't, there wasn't anything before that, really. Um, and I think for me that immediate reaction of seeing more the visceral action of the public. Um, seeing people hate me, you know? See, seeing people just disgusted, you know? And, and I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was amazing. I still think it's amazing. Um, and to see a language that was out in public that was understood by my peers. And it also taught me that, that art is a language. Art is a language that, that transcends and is understood by masses, um, but it, it, it doesn't require us to all speak the same language. It doesn't require us to have the same background. It doesn't have, require us to do anything but to see it. And um, so all of those things were very, very impactful for me as an artist in, in both my practices. I got into doing murals um, because it was safer. <laughs> Uh, and, and I became a mother and, and I began to think about the impact that my art has in public spaces and has on me. And I think some of that was maturing and, and being able to understand that that's a large platform. You have a platform of, of, of the public. And in that process, um, really wanted to it not be just about myself because I'm limited in myself, you know? We all are. It, it's, I, I'm, only, I'm only one person. I only have so many thoughts. And so I, I really became interested in how I could create work with the other people that were in those spaces. Also, um, moving into other spaces and being invited to create work in, in other communities and feeling like I had a response. Well, there's a stewardship, right? There's a stewardship of the work that has to exist. And I know that I've seen public artwork that I felt was non-reflective of my community, and I have to live with it. And I didn't want to go in feeling like, oh, I'm just going to like claim this. Um, I did that enough. I did that as a graffiti artist. And it was really about this idea of sharing and creating something that would, um, again, like kind of share in this exchange, and until it was until it was gone. Um, when I make paintings, um, paintings was kind of like 
this like, I, I started painting when I became pregnant and really like taking that, that side of it, you know, really seriously, like studying the body, studying form, studying um, composition in a rectangle. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, really trying to make that make a lot of sense to me. And so that's always been kind of this internalized practice. But also that like, the idea of painting is, is so weird, because I think that, um, you know, I work, I, I always look at murals as being ephemeral. I think of them um, and, and our landscapes as being ephemeral and ever changing and buildings as much as we want them to think that they're going to be monoliths and be there forever. Um, I hope they're not. And I hope my work dies with it. Um, but in, when you make work for a museum and when you make paintings, there's like this art archivalness, like you're, it's meant to stick around forever. Um, you get asked about that. <laughs> what did you use in this? How, how long is it going to last? Um, and for me, I, I want to create work that can be held in that way. So I think about things probably a lot longer when they enter an institutional space. Um, it's really a time for me to kind of explore ideas that um, can have, have a lot of different discourse around it, I think. Um, I think that there's, I don't know, it's just a different approach, a, approach for me. Um, I also like the idea of working very delicately um, and, and working with something that I can be like soft with. Um, mural making process is, is a very rugged experience. Um, <coughs> you know, nice. I was trying to cover it up. <laughs> Up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> it's, it's a good segue. I'm so <laughs> it's been it's been a, yeah, be soft. It's been a really long weekend, very busy weekend, and I know that each of you um you were able to come to Nani's opening and Ani, Nani you were able to come to Jeffrey's opening and I know you you haven't probably had the opportunity to spend you know, very quiet, reflective time with each other's work, but I just wanted to invite you to share some thoughts and maybe some questions you might have for each other, um, kind of experiencing each other's exhibitions and knowing each other as friends and, and seeing the work develop over time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I'm in awe. I'm just like, Jeffrey, your work is incredible. It's, it's, um, I love how, amazing and immersive it is um, in every sense of it. And I think that that's one of the things that we're able to do as artists. And maybe our calling as artists is like to create other worlds. And it's one of the things that's most appealing to me as being an artist um, is being able to, to create, create an environment and Stepping into your exhibition is like otherworldly. It's in in every step of the way you you are sh you are taking part in in a complete thought, but also like an immersive thought in another place. You're transformed. It's transformative. Um, but one thing I did want to ask you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did. I I love the title of this show. And I love the title of the show, Speaking of Otherworldly. And, of course, there's um, the reference to I, I, I Sing the Body Electric, mm -hmm. the poem, and more importantly to me, the, the Ray Bradbury um, collection of short stories and then the Twilight Zone thing that was made out, out of it. And I, I'd wonder kind of like where you, you came with the title. It's the embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> it's the television show Fame, yeah, uh, which I grew up with, which again was probably part of like I was looking at New York City as like a young kid, and um, wanting to go someplace where there was like Dominican people and Puerto Rican people and Black people and 
white people and gay people, and it was the 80s, and I thought, you know, God, I've got to go to New York, and I have to get into this school, because I realized it was a real school, too. And so that song, um, The Body Electric, I think, um, I knew about the Walt Whitman poem, of course, but when I read the Walt Whitman poem, I was like, I don't want to, that's not my <laughs> starting point. I know that's the starting point of the song and many other things, but, um, but I wanted to, uh, to start, like I said, with something that was more kind of, because I think, you know, the thing about contemporary culture that's so interesting to me is that I can see people crave realness, they crave time, they crave transformation, they crave real experiences, but we sabotage ourselves like a hundred times a day, you know? And, and I think that that song is kind of a mix of it, right? It's sort of, it's a song in, in that iteration. It's a song about wanting to be in this kind of mortal place, but somehow thinking that like being, being extraordinary in this space leads on to becoming like one of, becoming a star, like a celestial star and like joining the universe. And so I think this kind of, you know, even if you think about growing up, what, what used to be referred to as like with a foot in two worlds or however people want to describe it for Native people, you know, even if that's the case, it still had to all culminate in one body, like my body. Like I still had to go home at night and think about, you know, um, traditional stories of my family and then stories of, New York City and the world, and at that time, you know, uh, electronic music and digital culture, and uh, emerging LGBTQIA plus voices and and AIDS, you know, I, and so there was this kind of thing where I think that that show, um, in a pop cultural way, touched on all of these things minutely. So I don't discredit any of the other iterations, but that's where it started for for me. And I remember even telling Brandy when we were. I was a little late coming with the title, yeah. and and I was like, I was kind of sheepishly sad. I was like, here's a, here it is, <laughs> like, here's the, and I sent you the opening the opening um, scenes from from Fame the Show. Um, <laughs> so that's where that's where it's from. It's all true. But somebody sent me something on Instagram. Uh, it was a New York Times article about the Walt Whitman poem. Is that person here? Um, but it basically was saying that somebody wrote a critique that there's been times when that Walt Whitman poem was seen as kind of like too much and was, was uh, censored, um, which is kind of interesting because it is about the kind of the, the, um, like the lusciousness and the kind of like bodily quality of nature and it almost turns us into um, part of nature as opposed to like being a kind of you know, top of the pyramid person in nature. Have you, are you familiar with the Ray Bradbury story? No. So the Ray Bradbury story is, and I actually, I was curious <clears throat> if this was, if this was part of it, but the Ray Bradbury story is a little more sinister, of course, um, in that it's about in the future and they, this family is tasked with building, rebuilding their robot grandma. Uh huh. <laughs> and it's like this, yeah, it's like this joyous yeah. experience that everyone kind of partakes wow. in. And there's one, you know, person, one, uh, I can't remember, she, well, she's the granddaughter, <laughs> or maybe a great granddaughter, and she's just like, this is weird. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> and the grandma's built. And she's loving, and she's yeah. wonderful, and she's there, and she embodies all the things of grandma and finally wins over this, this uh, young person. And so I thought about hmm. your show as kind of being this future grandma, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and having this care around, um, around the unforeseen, but also like cradling and holding the past. Mm -hmm. And this kind of like moment of now, that ever-changing moment of now. But, um, but yeah, there, there's another yeah. reference for you. Well, I, I mean, I have to say, I grew up hating science fiction um, <laughs> because I, it just felt like, um, I guess I, I never felt like it told, I never felt like we were reflected in science fiction. No. Like Native people were yeah. never reflected in science fiction. And, and so um, I think that's really why I didn't like it. And then, and then realizing that a lot of people when they were non-Native people, when they were writing scripts for science fiction, 
where Oppenheim's looking at non-Western cultures for like ways of dressing, ways of speaking, ways of moving, ways of forming community as models. And so then I really resented that. So, but, but suddenly, yeah, this idea of like indigenous futurism, you know, which I know is, I, I remember I started thinking about it probably like, I don't know, maybe eight or nine years ago as like a conscious thought. And then I realized with all these gaps in native histories, it's like, oh, we have to gather all these stories so that we can be in the present. Then from the present, we can start thinking about like a future. So that's what a lot of my kind of collecting, whether it's like words or objects or, you know, any sort of histories, that's kind of where that comes from. So it's not, that doesn't seem so far off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't seem so far off. And a couple of people have written about some pieces now with a kind of futuristic sci-fi narrative to it. Um, the piece, the Raven, the piece with Raven, um, which is a video called A Warm Darkness, which was literally the editing was done maybe a week ago. Yeah, you almost give me a heart attack. Yeah, I know, I know. But <laughs> They're like, it's coming. I'm it's like, coming. when, when, when is it coming? <laughs> but Raven and I really bonded over, um, I think, kind of like a darkness. Like, it's, it's a warm, I mean, a warm darkness is where the title came from. But a, a, a kind of darker side of indigenous thought and, and perspectives that is not necessarily aligned with the Western dark side of like evil and bad. Mm -hmm. It's a place of, um, of accepting the unknown, of walking with a lot of trust, and I think kind of letting things unfold. And, and as a human, not speaking up too much, but just like shut up and just listen, you know? And so that, um, I think that video, which I, I love it, it's, um, it's like a drone. And you just, it, hopefully it just like feeds you just enough to continue sitting there and watching. And then all of a sudden you're in a whole different place. But that piece was written about in a sci-fi way. And then also the fringe cubes, I think were definitely, um, well, they're, they're influenced by that monolithic uh, sculpture in 2001 Space Odyssey. Uh -huh. mm. Okay, my turn. Okay. Yeah. That's <laughs> This when is I, fun. This I'm really glad. <laughs> I know, I know. We're still here. We're still We're here. So um, <laughs> we have a few things to work out. <laughs> um, so uh, um, one, I'm really glad you're making paintings. Um, I was thrilled to walk in and see paintings. And even though they're massive paintings, they're paintings. And I, I think probably the, my paying attention to painters my whole life made me so excited to see them in a way that, um, oddly enough, they have a different public because they can move around differently. Mm -hmm. And I just think they're so well made. There's, you're such a good painter. And I think that scale, it's, it's just, it's really not common to see somebody be able to just handle a brush in the way that you do. And it's just perfect. It's just perfect. And they're so, and again, because I've been in this mindset of looking at painting so long, they, they're so different. Each one is so specifically different. And that, for a painter, can be really hard because um, I feel like, you know, like with my own work even, it's always trying to think about, like, how is this painting different from that painting? And yours completely are, are very different. And, um, yeah, I guess, I mean, I, you're younger than I am, so I'm really excited to see, like, what you'll do in the future because I think it feels like that moment when you've worked so hard to kind of get all the tools on the table to get everything there so you can look at it. And now you get to kind of do what you want to do with it, which is kind of, can be frightening, a little daunting, but also really exciting. And um, I'm excited to see you show more on the East Coast. I would love to see more of that. And I would love to see actually murals on the East Coast too, because I think they're really important. And I think, you know, I know for me with some of, and this is just kind of institutional stuff, but, for some things that I've been a finalist for, some of the criticisms have been, people believe that n indigenous America lives in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, well, Jeff's project would make more sense in New Mexico or in Arizona, or why would we do it here in New York City? But it's so important for the works to kind of like circulate around and cross all of those geographic borders. And it's a really strong message that it's not just geographic, I mean, the geographic borders are manufactured. So uh, all of it is, it can all be shifted, you know? So I think in its own way, I think that's why I love the fact that they're paintings is I think they can, they can move in a very different way. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I love that about the work too. And um, I definitely feel like this, this show brought out just my own need and want to make studio work again. Mm -hmm. um, this has been like, I haven't made a collection of paintings, like sat down, painted, painted my butt off uh, <laughs> in a studio for like probably like seven years. And I've been creating these large scale works like this <coughs> for the past five years, but making one, like one big painting a year because most of my practice wow. has been like doing, doing murals and doing other work and, um, you know, kind of dividing myself in all these different facets. So, but it really felt like a big exhale um, because there, I, I love painting. I, it's, it's the only thing I can do you know, on 15 hours on end, mm -hmm. and it's, I love it, it's, it's, it's how I communicate. Um, but yeah, I really feel that need to, to be able to create a complete thought, or create a thought, because that's the strength of creating a body of work, um, is being able to hold that in a lot of different ways, and being able to work through that also um, without interruption that that's something that I think and maybe why they're you know painting is such a hard like I, I feel like painters are really dedicated in that way because it takes so much studio time to really like and in, dive into that part of process um, but thank you for saying that about yeah. traveling because that is very very important and um I, I'm excited for that too, and I, I, I've wanted. I haven't shifted back to making smaller works. Um, like I said, I've been doing this for the past five years, um, because to me, there's also still this like immersive quality, and for me, it's like a little bit of a sweet spot, you know, doing this ten foot painting because they're any larger, and it wouldn't have the intimacy. There's a proximity in space, right? And that's always something that is super interesting to me is like how we work and move and take part in space. Um, and I'm always constantly aware of this when I create murals is um, how that space in front of the wall, in front of, is gonna be used, how the public is gonna interact with that, how does the image and the size and scale and movement of that piece affect the way that the viewer interacts with it. And for me, the creating a painting at, at 10 feet is, it's immersive, um, where you're able to create your own space with the, even within a gallery, which is its own space. Um, but it's not so large that you're getting this drawback, mm -hmm. you know? It, it still has this intimate quality of it, of people coming in and feeling like they're invited. And um, also the material that I'm choosing to paint on. Um, I just, I love, I love the, the delicateness of it. Um, I'm always, I'm, I'm intrigued by that. I'm intrigued by the idea of something being massive, but like also feeling like it could just like fall away at any mm -hmm. moment or look like paper and it could just blow, um, which, which that material has that, that quality. But, yeah, I, I really feel like this exhibition is, has um, kind of like opened something up more for me and I, I, I do want to continue working mm -hmm. in that way. And thank you for saying all of that because that's really reaffirming. I think the scale is perfect. Like, and it's interesting too because when you're a young painter and I've taught for so many years, for almost 20 years now, trying to get a young painter to go big you know, is like such an intimidating thing. So this is actually you coming down. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, you're coming in. You're coming in on the larger side. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, it is. <laughs> yeah. Which is, it's also, it's, a, it's some people, it's, it's hard to do, and you do it really well. So um, I have one more question, and then maybe we can op open it up and have a few questions from the audience. But um, I, see, I see your exhibitions as alive. Um, I see your works as having anim animacy. Um, they have their own life force. You can't deny it when you walk through 
the exhibitions, when you walk through the spaces, they, they have their own histories and their own, their own life force. Um, and so, you know, there's a philosophy um, that says, you know, when you make decisions or take an action in the world, you have to consider how it'll ripple, ripple through time, through the time of seven generations moving forward. And I, and I wonder, you know, what do you hope that your work will bring to the future when you, when you birth it and put it out in the world as you have? Mm, it's a tough, um, it's a big question. You know, <laughs> want to chew on it, but, you know. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of, I, I don't know if I ever think that far, you know, like, what will the future think of this? What will the future, how will the future hold this? Of course, I do feel like, um, especially with this body of work, that, that this, is, this is the way for me to contribute to, to our oral histories. Um, like, let's say that the whole show was kind of locked up. It was, like, thrown in a basement, and then, like, you know, somebody found it in 100 years or something. They're like, check this out. Whoa, crazy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I hope happened. <laughs> um, but then that conversation would reignite. You know, I'm, I always love... I, l I love the conversation. I, I think that me as an artist, the intrigue and being able to interact with a work and knowing that, those, that that work, that my work, no matter what I make, whatever I make, is always going to kind of be voicing and have the agency of an indigenous woman now. Um, and to me, that's, that's a very important piece that I feel like I'm contributing, whether it's now or it's into the future. Um, and I don't, I don't really know. I mean, once you make something, um, you know, I guess part of, part of the artistic process is, you know, just self, like, you know, the obsession, the like needing to get an idea out of your head so it exists. Um, and, it, and then after that, it is alive. And, and where that goes from there, I think, is, is less reflective of me, but, like, reflective of everybody else. So that makes good sense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, I think I, um, I, I think of what I do as sort of, like, just, you know, we're all going to leave behind a story. Everyone in here is going to leave behind a story. And I remember there was one artist, and I, I think a, a young student asked them, you know, what's the best advice you could give to a young artist? And I loved her answer. Um, it was Alexandra Grant, who was the artist. And she said, your responsibility is to lead, um, to leave the, lead the most interesting life that you can. And, and I was like, okay, that's like a start. It felt like a starting point, but it's true. I feel like if the people who I've grown up fascinated with, there's evidence of their life. And whether you find it in a, a journal of theirs or photographs or objects that they made, I think that those are the things that, um, for all the histories that aren't written, that don't get kind of included in the, the kind of main storytelling <coughs> of, uh, of many things, it's so important that that kind of evidence exists, even if it's in like a pot or if it's in someone, I'm thinking of the um, ceramicist George Orr, who made his own coins out of clay, um, or uh, another painter, I can't think of right now, but it was a painter who, who was clearly dealing with trans, trans uh, uh, gender dysmorphia in their paintings, Forrest Bess. And, um, and I think that that kind of evidence means that what we're kind of turning into a spectacularized story now, it's like, oh, no, this has been around with us as humans for as long as, as, long as we've been around. And um, so that's what I hope to leave behind. It's also what drives the collaborations you know, I think wanting to show that it's like the, um, it, it's not just an individual, but you know, even in this exhibition, my gosh, there's got to be at least a couple hundred people represented in mm -hmm. the work between people who worked on the mural, um, the musicians who I, I refer to, um, the studio team, everyone who took part in To Name Another. I mean, at this, this is the fourth iteration of To Name Another, so at this point, nearly 200 people have taken part. And, um, so all of that 
I know there's no way for me to document it, include it in a catalog, for instance. But you know, with cell phones, there's got to be thousands of pictures floating around of people selfieing with their friends in the garments, you know, yeah. and tagging each other. So it just kind of like proliferates, and I think that that's um, it's just kind of where I'm at right now, I guess. And I think um, the great thing about being an artist, and I tell people this, it gets weirder as you get older. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't get more under your belt or anything like that. It gets more and more weird, and. Um, <laughs> So I'm trying to just enjoy that. I'm trying to enjoy the kind of uh, the wildness of what it can be um, and, and where I can grow as a person individually. And I think that for me is sort of, you know, also it's a very limited number. Jean is one of those people. Jean Quick to see Smith is one of those people who sort of let her life lead her. And she's kind of making decisions in tandem with this unfolding story, right? And she right. still is today. So I think that kind of example is what I would like to leave behind. Yeah. Not that I'm going anywhere. Yeah. Soon, yeah. but like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, I Thank you. Thank you. Uh, while I'm thanking people and have your attention, I'd like to thank all my colleagues here at Site Santa Fe for uh, helping put together this fabulous program and. Um, waking up early on a Sunday morning for all of us. Thank you. And thank you to everyone uh, who has uh, supported the show uh, and has uh, traveled great distances to be here and uh, celebrate the work. And with that, I'd like to open it up. If anybody has any questions, um, we can take a few. And I'm going to bring the microphone to you. I think that's the way I should do it. Is this the one I should take, Johnny? OK. I'm moving now. See you guys. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, quick question about, um, you know, uh, maybe on that last uh, invocation of the community involvement. So, you know, social practice, community engagement, it's been a thing for a while, um, <clears throat> heavily funded. Um, and I'm just wondering if, what, what do you think are the differences between the way in which uh, Western artists, I'm going to create a false binary here, uh, Western artists engage uh, community engagement projects versus uh, indigenous artists. In other words, uh, you know, often the, a critique would be that community engagement uses community as medium rather than as collaborator. Um, and of course, with ind an indigenous practice, there's often things like reciprocity that are, you know, part of the mix. So I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's hard for me to get in in the mindset of a, of another artist and their intentions on why or how they create work or how they came to the conclusions that they came to. But um, in my practice, I, and, and it, you know, I, I'm Diné, so it's an indigenous practice, I guess, um, is that I, I'm interested in, I, I'm not interested in labor. I can, I can do the labor side of it. Um, or I'd rather pay somebody who is interested in the labor. Um, what I'm interested in is thinking outside of myself um, and being able to engage or collaborate more so with somebody and to move, have the project move even in in its process itself. It becomes unpredictable and it becomes fun for me. That, that's, that's the thing that's most engaging about it, is that it becomes fun because it becomes unpredictable. I don't, I don't know what's gonna happen at the beginning of it. And by the end, we create something together. And that's really, really interesting. For me to start with an idea and be like, okay guys, like this is, 
these are the moving parts, you know, this is what you're going to do, um, is, is a little bit less, um, less interesting for me in, in the way that I make work. Um, but I think every artist, to, um, just to be fair and maybe not, not uh, create that kind of binary, because I think every artist works differently, um, is that, you know, for me, I, I'm interested in, in just the shift that can take place within any one project. And, and then that part of the project becomes interesting. Um, otherwise, I just paint in my studio. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'm going to create another possibly, you know, false binary here. I think a lot of, you know, I've taught in art schools for 20 years, went to art school, and I think that have oftentimes been the only native artist in my program, right? I didn't realize my peers were wealthy <laughs> until, you know, one day they were like, oh yeah, that's how they pay $4,000 a month rent, you know, and I was like, oh. And I guess when I'm listening to your question, I'm thinking that I think artists who come from, or people who come from a challenging background, right, when it comes to um, whether it's healthcare, education, housing, money, poverty, um, you have to rely on your community. And, and you, you just can't do it by yourself. And maybe that's sort of the big shift between that kind of being in your DNA versus an institutional prescription of social practice. And so, for instance, in my life, you know, the, both of my grandfathers were Southern Baptist ministers who organized churches in Indian communities in Oklahoma and Mississippi, really as a way of kind of healing the kind of decimation of those communities. And so it was the place where people would come for clothing, for food, for daycare. You know, you went to church four times a week. Um, and there was definitely a rift between the traditionalists who were still dancing ceremonial dances and then the Christianity. But by the 90s, they had come together. So it's out of like familial relationships and tribal relationships. And I think as I've gotten older, I realize how fortunate we are that we have that as a model. Um, you really just, and I, I know because I don't live within a native community, I feel like when I go into um, someone else's community, I'm very aware of it's my time to be quiet, it's my time to listen, it's my time to kind of move a little slower. And so I, I, with social practice or community-based things, I, I really try to be very aware of what I can actually commit to and not kind of paint a picture of, you know, longevity. Um, because I, I think for what I do, it's more important that we do, we, we, we craft an experience that can happen in a limited amount of time that has genuine impact. And um, I know with the performance, to name another, for instance, a lot of those people have continued in their forming their own communities. They found each other in, in those, those uh, performances. And so that, to me, I'd, I'm not needed any longer for that to kind of grow. And, and I, feel, I feel really good about that. But I think that, um, yeah, and there's just so many, you know, in terms of indigeneity, um, like just kinship philosophies, our community extends to the land. So it's not just about people, but um, animals, people, sky, water. And so I think those models, I realize how fortunate we are to have them. Thanks, Jeffrey. Anybody else have a question? Take this young man here. What is the oldest art piece you remember or your first art piece? Of our own or one of somebody else? Of your own. Oh, yeah. Okay, you go. <laughs> um, oldest art piece. Um, geez. I don't know. Um, I loved cartoons. I, I really love cartoons, and I think, like, one of the things was me and my brother used to collect stickers. Like, we were really into stickers. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think if I had to, like, think about an art piece, like something I, 
I like put on the wall and treasured and would look at and was inspired by, it was all of those stickers. And we got like really into like scratch and sniff stickers and just like <laughs> <Run> <laughs> garbage <with> pill <laughs> kid stickers and the puffy stickers and we would even put them in books and really really just like love them and I you know they were like also like you could put them anywhere so like it was the first way to really kind of like see art and put it in my environment and and love it and be envious of other stickers that other people had. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess that's maybe it. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. It's really complicated, actually. <laughs> it's because, really complicated. Because when you're young, like, I don't think I was thinking about art. You know, I was just making things that I loved making. And so I'm thinking about just when you were saying that, I was like, what's something I really enjoyed that was not something you would do every day? And I remember I used to grow my nails out to just enough that I could go in the garage and I would hammer a, a nail through it. Whoa! Well, to, but to, to make a hole, to make a hole. And then I would go get my mother's earrings and put them all oh, in so cool. to the holes. And I just remember sitting in the garage and being like, that is cool, you know? <laughs> so was that art? I don't know. Yes. But like I said, it gets weirder as you get older. So there's a chance it could show up in the future, you know? Um, because I think there's this period also where people are teaching you what art is and that's such a, it's such a challenge to get over those things that people have taught you. This is what art is, this is what it looks like, this is what it sounds like. So it's, you have to get back to the place of where you were a kid and you're just like, like what is it I want to do? You know, and what is it I want to do? What is it I want to make? And then just try to listen to that voice until you finish something. Great answer. That's amazing. Sorry. <laughs> Any, I, I saw someone else raise their hand this, this way. Okay. I was a weird kid. <laughs> that sounds cool. Yeah, I know. Uh, this is a question for Jeffrey, and it follows on immediately from what you just said. Yeah. <laughs> you went to the Royal College of Art in London, which yeah. is kind of the flagship yeah. graduate program in all of Britain. What did you gain from that and what did you gift to the school by being there from such a different culture? I probably didn't gift too much to be honest <laughs> um, but what I gained was um, well you know it, I went there in 1990 uh, must have been 96 when I went there and so in the United States at that time especially in art school it was this very um, identity politics moment that was kind of suffocating. It was almost impossible to find your own voice without somebody coming, without somebody coming in and telling you, you know, trying to narrow it for you, when at that time you really should be going much more expansive. And so when I got to England, uh, a couple of things happened. One, there was a Nigerian woman who two weeks after I was there came up to me on the bus and she was actually quite angry with me and she said, what the F is your problem? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, why haven't you spoken to any of the black students at college? And I said, I just got here, I'm shy, but, and also just for, for your information, I'm, I'm American Indian, I'm not, I'm Native American, I'm not black. And she said, well, look, mate, she's like, this is England. She's like, and here you're either black or white, and you, my friend, are black. And we got off of the bus, and she took me and introduced me to every black student, and that became my social circle while I was there. And it was kind of amazing to be another race <laughs> by other people's perceptions of me. And it took me into a whole other world um, of, of metal and, and drum and bass and different fashion and clubs and parties. And, um, and I think it gave me this tremendous break from what was going on in the US at the time. And a lot of the um, European students were very interested in craft of paintings, craft of art in the more traditional sense. And I think in the US, um, it was sort of like a free for all. It was like, do what you want to do and show up with it and get some feedback. So it was a different kind of environment. And um, looking at the US from a distance is also, I think, really interesting for, for anybody, looking at your home, your home country um, and then thinking about how Native people are represented within that. And so I was ready to come back three years later for sure. Um, 
And it made me realize that this is really where I belong. I think it was pretty early on I made a commitment that I was like, I want to be an artist here, and this is where I want to practice. But yeah, that was... Thank you. I think uh, we've run pretty, pretty long on time, so I just want to thank you all again for coming and encourage you to check out the exhibitions. You can go through these back doors and in through the side door and experience the exhibition again through different lens, hopefully. And um, have a lovely, happy Mother's Day, everyone. Thank you both for, thank you. for everything. Thank you. thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nani. Yeah.